Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Between the Notes. I'm Kirk Bester, and I've been doing these episodes, these little mini television uh, YouTube uh, experiences. I don't quite, quite know what to call them. They're not really performances. They're not, it's not really a class on how to arrange music, but we talk about all the above. Um, if you haven't seen the previous episodes, feel free to go onto my YouTube website, K Bester, um, and uh, subscribe there. I do one of these a week. And this week's episode deals with film scoring. A lot of people, when they listen to my music uh, and they don't know that I score films, say, wow, your music sounds like a film score, uh, which uh, probably is a compliment. I say that because when I first started writing music, arranging music and performing music, my music did have kind of a visual sound, melodic uh, listenable looks kind of like it looked kind of like a film score looking for a movie people used to say and then um, I did a lot of film scoring uh, over the years uh, I think I've scored over 40 feature-length films numerous documentaries television shows and so forth um, I don't do as much anymore I mean I do them every year but not as I used to have a steady diet of them uh, to be honest the budgets have gone down number two the style of film scoring that's really popular right now, which is very effective in movies, um, is not the most creatively stimulating to me. Uh, I kind of grew up with the John Williams thematic themes, <clears throat> Danny Elfman, Thomas Newman, uh, back when he was doing more of that sort of thing, uh, Bruce Broughton, going back further, Elmer Bernstein. And uh, those type of, uh, John, Jerry Goldsmith, I mean, I could list off a bunch. I loved taking thematic materials and using kind of a light motif where you would take a theme like bum ba -dum, bum bum ba -dum, and, and that would happen throughout the movie and you would know, ah, Harrison Ford's going to appear because you hear the music. It's, it goes way back to... Um, the days of opera when they would use light motifs whenever the bad guy would come in it would be bad music the good guy would come in good music romantic music and so forth um and that was pretty popular for a long time we, we've gone through different episodes or different uh, generations of film scoring back in the early uh, 30s when uh, max steiner did gone with the wind that was one of the first big orchestra thematic movies that was out there after talkies and we went, then we kind of got a little nuts with the theme thing back in the 40s. I mean, I love the score, Laura, David Raxon did that. But if you listen to it, it's at, with today's ears, you're going, whoa, that's a lot of music and that's a lot of melody. Then we took kind of a break from that and went to kind of the uh, Elmer Burn, I'm sorry, the, um, uh, shoot, uh, the Herman, uh, Bernard Herman type scores. If you, and most people, if you don't know his name, you have certainly heard his famous shower scene with the strident striking of the uh, with a knife in, the, in Psycho. He was known for kind of a rhythmic, not as much thematic material, although he did have some themes. He was uh, kind of waiting for his time in a, in a way. And we're kind of back to that now. Oh, anyway, then we went to kind of the 1960s, which was um, not... There were still those type scores, but then we started doing comedies and you had Henry Mancini doing his Pink Panther and you started getting pop music infused. So drums, drum sets, rhythms and so forth. Then John Williams comes along uh, in the early 70s and mid 70s and of course Star Wars. And that was uh, kind of the re-emergence of melody in film scores. And we kind of rode that wave for a while. <clears throat> but I think people were kind of, uh, as films change and styles morph, people went to kind of uh, atmospheric scores. And we're, we're kind of there right now, where you can't really tell the difference between film score and sound design. Sometimes they're done by the same guy. Certainly they're done in tandem. Um, you can go through a whole score, like, uh, I don't know if you saw the award-winning score to... Um, Joker this year was written by an Icelandic female composer did a really a masterful job I mean it's a tough film to watch 
She's a cellist, and she played cello, but I dare you to think of any thematic material that comes from the music. It was all kind of uh, textural, strident, lyrical in a weird kind of way. Uh, uh, it wasn't like horror mu music, but playing against what we were watching on screen, it was pretty horrific. Well, anyway, um, that kind of takes you through where we are. I know we still have uh, melodic scores, the kind of scores that I've been known for, that I've done. Uh, and I'm sure that they'll come back again and they'll be, we'll, we'll move in and out of this whole thing as film music changes. But I thought I would feature today a film score that I did for a, an IMAX style movie, a large screen. IMAX is a IMAX is the brand, but a large screen formatted movie called The Great American West. It's, uh, it wasn't on the screens very long. There was a, a few issues dealing with some legal things and so forth. So it really didn't get to play that much, but you can watch it. I think I saw it on Hulu. It's also on Amazon Prime. And it, it's a, you know, I, I wish you could go to the theater and see it in the big screen because that's where it needs to be listened to. Also because the, the score that it wrote for it was as big as the West and as big as the screen. I'm going to feature today um, a scene from the movie. <laughs> it was it was a real tough scene to do. Let me explain what the scene's about. <clears throat> it's about a bear chasing a guy. But it's not, which sounds horrific, right? Uh, but it's not as horrific as it sounds in a way because what I had, the scene I had to score was a, a trapper, uh, and a, you know, an outdoor trapper, fur trapper, telling a group of his buddies at a some sort of convention they had in those days, I guess, of fur trappers, where he would explain, he was telling a tall tale. And I'm sure that he was chased by a bear, but the way he made it sound, it really took on uh, bigger than life sensibility. So I decided to score it like, almost like a cartoon. And in, in the film music business, uh, a derogatory term, actually, for the most part, unless you're doing an old style cartoon, is to Mickey Mouse a scene. And what that means is if, if you Mickey Mouse a scene, that means you, you play with your music every little movement, you know, every little hit, every little turn, every little run, every slow down. I mean, every aspect is hit, like the movies did. Uh, there was a guy named Carl Stalling who was really great at doing cartoon music. I think it's one of the reasons why people love watching it so much. The music was a big part of it. Well, anyway, in this scene, I decided to score the show, score, score the scene from the perspective of the fur trapper telling the story. So as you watch the scene, uh, the bear's chasing the guy. It's scary, but I wanted to make it bigger than life. I wanted to make it scary, but not Bernard Herrmann scary. I wanted to make it... Um, I don't know, kind of humorous, but scary all at the same time with lots of energy. And uh, anyway, here is a scene from The Great America West, one of the film scores that I scored a long time ago, featuring a scene, didn't have a name, we just call it The Bear Chase. I was at that campfire, the night the legendary Hugh Glass himself first told the story of him and the bear. It was a rendezvous of 1826 at Bent's Fort. It seems Glass was trapping somewhere up on the Yellowstone when he got trapped himself. Thank <laughs> you. 